Hello, everyone. Um, none of us are experienced in uh, pandemics. This is something that everyone's having to feel their way, world leaders as well as us uh, who are trying to just work in the communities. <clears throat> what I wanted to do today was to uh, see what do we understand from a big scale community impacts out of natural disasters and how might we extract some principles from that that we can apply to, to this COVID situation, which is unfolding slowly, inexorably, and uh, will probably be, be with us for apparently many months. So we will have a lot of learnings as we go along. I want to start really with the situation before the disaster, before the impact. Because I think we live in our ordinary life immersed in uh, routines and other taken for granted situations that we really have a lot of trouble in being really clear and conscious about. The, the fact that these structures and uh, processes and roles and uh, the social routines we're involved in actually hold us together and give us focus and direction is part of what we just take for granted. But we know that when the disaster disrupts this situation, we need to understand what's been lost, not just in terms of houses or health, but in terms of the social fabric, this, the connections that actually hold the whole social world together. So we understand a lot about this in floods, fires, cyclones, earthquakes, because we know a lot about the recovery process and the years it takes for that to happen. What we need to do now is try and understand in what way is that relevant to something where there's no destruction of property, where the event is invisible, we don't know if we've got it for a long time. We don't know if we're passing it on. In fact, it's like an invisible ghost rippling through the community. So let's go back to the basics. We build up what I call constancies, stable, taken for granted assumptions about the way the world is from the repeated experiences of things being the same. And when they are always the same, we expect them, we take them for granted, and then we apply no conscious activity to taking a, a notice of them or processing them. We just absorb them. And they become part of our frame of reference, the framework that we must have in order to evaluate and make judgments about everything. They include the way the world is, the number of cars on the road, the way people behave, uh, the etiquette, the way we interact with people. They also include the roles we take on, the socially prescribed patterns of behaviour that we take on, whether in our private life, the role of a father, a parent, a child, an uncle, or at work, uh, a case manager, a supervisor, uh, whatever. And so these roles are things that we have to sort of take on gradually as we get into it. And then once we've settled into that role, it just guides our behaviour as best we can. Now, the important thing I want to emphasise here is that these structures organise our interactions. And as long as they hold, our interactions make sense, they're predictable. <clears throat> And anything that's predictable manages emotion, manages anxiety, the ever-present tendency to feel unpleasant, uh, ill at ease, on guard when things are uncertain. And so we think about this structure of familiarity as binding and containing and settling and providing a foundation from which we can then deal with the changing emotional impacts in our life. Now, the first thing that happens, of course, with an ordinary 
disaster, ordinary disaster, that is to say a physical disaster, a flood or a fire or something of that sort, is that there is at first warning and then the impact of a physical event. And the physical event provides the immediate tangible evidence of threat. We know from a lot of observations and research that the, the first thing that people who have not been well trained and prepared will do when they know of a flood or a fire is they'll rush out and try and see it themselves. They don't want to take other people's information. They need to eyeball it themselves. As a result, of course, they often get in a dangerous situation, very ill prepared. They thought they were going out to check and suddenly they're evacuating and they haven't brought anything with them. So it's this need to make concrete sensory confirmation of the information that seems to drive people. And we have to try to overcome that and teach people to accept the authoritative information of the experts. So they don't need to wait till the fire comes. They need to know that the circumstances on this day means, as we were told, you should get out of Gippsland. It's going to be a terrible day. We know the same about floods. Unfortunately, not about earthquakes most of the time. But the, these predictions gradually teach people they should act by experience. Now, the problem is that once we go into that state of being under threat, all of this fabric of normal life is no longer relevant because we're suddenly uh, dealing with a threat that overrides all the previous agendas, tasks, goals, priorities. And we've only got one priority, which is save ourselves and whoever else we can. And we have a moment where people no longer relate in the way they did before. They relate on the basic programming of their instinctive survival mechanisms. And it's very really important to understand this because they're no longer behaving in a role. They're no longer behaving in a, a predictable way. They're improvising everything. It doesn't mean they'll be rational and behave irrational and behave like in the Hollywood movies. They will improvise what makes the most sense in the current circumstances. Sometimes they get it right. Often they'll make silly mistakes when they look back on it and wish they'd done something else. But nevertheless, everyone's doing this. Now, what's going along with that is this narrowing and focusing of attention onto the immediate threat. And that means all of my energy focuses in away from all of my attachments and connections around onto the immediate here and now. And I'm doing that, what's more, with my whole emotional being engaged. And I call this the moment of debonding. And this is, I think, a very important thing to occur. Often people are not very good at explaining to us this moment of debonding because they're not aware of what's being lost. They're only aware of what they're focusing on in order to survive. And as people come out, they will, uh, out of the, the immediate threat, they will comment on how different everything is, how they greet each other with great embraces because they're so glad that they're alive, even if they don't know each other very well at all. And we get this sudden replacement of the debonded, isolated, everyone functioning as best they can into a coming together. And all that emotion now joins and you get a state of very high energy, mutual help, caring, people throwing their ha houses open, rushing around, rescuing and, and taking care of people, all the things that will, of course, most aid the immediate search and rescue. Now, if you compare that to the pre-existing complex social structure and the roles and everything, you'll find that there's not much of that there. It's still totally determined by the circumstances of the, of the event that's just passed. And I call this a state of fusion. It's as though you get, instead of a complex crystal lattice, you get this fusing together as a sort of a, a mass, a plum pudding, so to speak, instead of a social structure. And in this, everyone's closely bound with strong emotional bonds. And you see that in the way emotional communication rushes through the group, uh, rumours abound, but also useful information about who needs help and the transmission of material aid and, and support uh, by way of personal networks. 
And this fusion to begin with is enormously beneficial because it's a strong, coherent uh, kind of social structure that gives everyone a very strong sense of belonging. But the problem is it's based on a false assumption. And the false assumption is that we've all been through the same event. In actual fact, if we talk to people who've been through a fire, a flood, an earthquake, or any other kind of disaster, everybody's got their own story. Everybody's impacts are different. The meaning of the impacts are different. When we have two people who lose a house, the meaning of the house is quite different. So you can't equate the loss. It's no good trying to rank them and say this one's loss is worse than that one because this house is more expensive than that one or this house is older and more emotionally attached than that one. It doesn't work like that. It's too complicated. But in that high adrenaline state, in that uh, strong emotional state, which is kept in place by the fusion, we do see things in a simple way. That's what helps us survive. Black and white thinking, risk or not risk. And so there is this strong tendency to simplify the social environment in terms of ranking the problems. And so as the recovery gets going and the aid comes in and the insurance and so on, we suddenly find that people who thought they were together and had the same problem suddenly find themselves on opposite sides of a, a divide. One's insured and one's not. One's entitled to this form of assistance and that person's not. And uh, one person says, well, it's all very well for you. You've only lost stuff. I thought I was going to die. And the other one says, well, uh, you thought you were going to die. You should have evacuated. Uh, don't you realise I've lost everything I own? And this ability to start empathising with each other is very limited. So what we see is happening often is what I call cleavage planes, the divisions that we can have in a, a diamond or a strong crystal is a cleavage plane in the structure where if you hit it, it splits. And once these differences in the way the disaster has impacted, the way the help is coming in, are mobilised and made active, you see the whole community split and polarise. Uh, and people come in because of the fusion. They come in on one side or the other. And so we, get, we see that the fusion inevitably leads to a period of, of uh, division and conflict if we don't engage in a very strong community-led uh, alternative strategies, which are to build social structures that bring the different impacts and the different subgroups together so that they actually can support each other and tell their stories. So everyone can realise, actually, this is a lot more complex than we really thought. So this ability to bring in measured and thoughtful communication into the, the fusion to create advocacy groups and various other systems is all important to the developing recovery process. But what we see with disasters, that are, uh, like the bushfires we've ha had uh, at the beginning of this year, we see around about now it's starting to settle down. There are community advocacy groups and recovery committees forming that are actually interacting with the service providers and government that's giving their needs. And so the system starts to settle. And we're going to see how the houses will be cleared, the burnt houses, and slowly people will start to engage in the huge task. But what we need to realise is that actually everybody who's involved in a disaster suddenly got two lives. They got one life that they were leading before with whatever else they were doing, which was probably full up. Their time was fully occupied. Their energy was completely used. And suddenly they've got to build another house, re-establish a farm, develop a business, manage a trauma and all the other consequences. And so we've got people going into a state of inevitable overload, everybody not just the people who've had material loss, but everybody in the community. And to begin with, they're equal to it because they're in this state of adrenaline or in this stress state and they're very focused and motivated. So what we have learned over the years is it's very important in this period from about now, four months down the track, through to, let's say, two or three years, however long it takes, for people to actually not allow themselves to be driven by the priorities of the material damage, but to take stock, establish their lifestyle, 
reconfigure their family so it's supportive and functional, to build back in health and lifestyle activities that will preserve their ability to think and make decisions because they will be taking recreation, they will be seeing their friends, etc. And to do it more slowly because actually when I look at my experience over 40 years, I come to the conclusion that what really determines how life will be in five or six years after the event is not really what happens on the day or just straight afterwards, but how they do this next couple of years. If they do that slowly, carefully and methodically and take care of every other aspect of their life during this time, then they're going to come out probably and somewhere along the line they'll stop and think and reconfigure their plans and they'll come out with a new life plan and a new future and there'll be all sorts of opportunities in this. Now, that's the important message is this post-impact stage of the recovery. That's what determines the long-term outcome. And we know from the research, Daniel Aldrich and others, that the best predictor of outcome is not the amount of money that's spent or the amount of uh, material aid that's provided. They're very essential. But what best predicts it in the long term is the social capital, the networking, the availability of support, the communication systems, the sense of belonging and identity that flow from strong emotional and relevant communication patterns with your friends and neighbours. Now, therefore, we can say that social process is the absolute core of the recovery process and the determinant of the long-term outcome as to whether we get resilience and post-traumatic growth or whether we get lingering long-term deficits. Now, what does this all mean for COVID? Well, uh, I want to really just characterise the, the threat here. Uh, first of all, it's invisible. We can't see the virus. We're told about it. We're shown pictures of it, but we know we can't see it. Secondly, the virus uh, can be in us or not. We don't know. We won't know perhaps for weeks, perhaps, whether we're sick or whether we've passed it on without having symptoms, passed it on to other people. We won't know when we're clear of it unless we have a long period of time when nobody gets sick. Uh, how do we know when to relinquish the, uh, the patents we've got to protect ourselves? Uh, we only know about incubation periods and all of these things through information that professionals tell us. We have to trust that, don't we? But actually, we found that even with a bushfire, people telling, get out of Gippsland, there's going to be a fire, people said on television, no, I've paid for my holiday, I'm going to stay. And people wanted to go up and, and view the, the flames. It happens over and over again to see the flood, to eyeball it for themselves so they can satisfy themselves. Because that's what we do in normal life. We satisfy ourselves that we understand the problem when we've perceived it in some way. But there's nothing to perceive with COVID. Even when somebody gets sick, we've just got illness, maybe life-threatening, life-ending illness, but we don't understand how this relates to COVID-19. So we've got this intangible process that we can only deal with our mind. And this is one of the key problems with, uh, with this kind of dilemma. Um, and uh, we know that some people are quick to take it on. Uh, maybe people who are very health, health conscious or who have understanding about pandemics, maybe have read about them and say, wow, this is going to be huge. We really need to be careful. Or maybe it's people who are very anxious about their health anyway, who have reasons to be anxious, or maybe people who are uh, very concerned about cleanliness and so on. These people will take it up. But then there are a large number of other people who will be used to minimising things. And we got away with it all. I'm sure it's overstated. Uh, you know, when we work clinically, we... We have uh, lots of stories about people who talk about the uh, friends and neighbours they're involved with who uh, are, are clearly minimising it. Uh, so we've got this, this, uh, this, this problem of uh, the different approaches people take. And I think that the, the uh, lack of any sensory basis, any concrete basis, is so important. So therefore, 
becomes very important that when we communicate about it, we communicate in a way that speaks to our experience. We give anecdotes, we use metaphors, we use images, so that people can get hold of what this really means. And uh, that has to be, of course, harnessed to behaviour. And we've seen this gradual ramping up of uh, isolation and, uh, and restrictive behaviours to protect ourselves. And only when it starts to work does it make sense. But what does that mean? That actually means that apart from electronic communication, we see the equivalent of debonding happening, but in slow motion without an immediate physical threat. In other words, everyone goes home. Uh, they start working from home. A lot of patterns of interaction fall away. We don't go to restaurants and bars and or even play games or even visit our families. And so I think one of the questions that I'm going into this with, what does it actually mean when we can't engage in those routine patterns of interaction that helped us feel connected with other people? I suspect that's a challenge to our identity. Am I still the same person I thought I was? We know under normal circumstances, if my friends and relatives don't come and visit me or talk to me, I start to ask a question about myself. Do they still like me? Uh, and so I think at the moment, that problem is overridden by the novelty of it all. It's unusual. And the threat and the figures about people dying. But as we go forward, can we hold that reality? Or do we start to feel a little bit hurt and isolated that no one's been talking to us? Does that become a bit of a threat to us? Those of us who work in the clinical field already know that uh, numbers of our clients and patients are really struggling with isolation at home. And here you start to get this tremendous spread. Just like one person's house doesn't mean the same as another person's house. Staying home for six months for some people might be a wonderful chance to just be at home for a while and enjoy whatever you like to do at home. Uh, even if you're working from home. And for somebody else, they feel cooped up in a place that's filled with unhappy memories and they can't use the usual escapes they use to try and cheer themselves up. So I think we've got to be prepared for a very complicated picture here. This is a little bit difficult from my observation for the media to show us because they do show us a lot of images of how people are being creative, like the man who ran a marathon on his. Uh, apartment balcony, which I think took him six and a half hours with about 10 steps in each direction. That's pretty creative. Or the guy that's uh, filmed himself uh, doing uh, mountain skiing with a whole display on his floor, and it's very amusing. These, these are creative, uh, very interesting and helpful things. But of course, the person who's depressed and unhappy and wonders whether it'll ever end and is terrified of losing their lives and they're not going to be able to get anything together for the media. So I think it becomes very important to, for us to have ways of understanding what is this actually doing that we need to take account of in this psychosocial space. And I would urge people who have access to different community networks, case managers or whatever, try to feed the anecdotes through in some way into uh, those people who have the responsibility for recovery planning uh, to organisations like Red Cross who have an opportunity to think about programs of recovery because we're actually trying to diagnose the problem as we're going into it. I want to just mention a couple of other things is that wherever debonding occurs, it means the loss of the structure that provided our frame of reference and our security. The loss of security in the presence of threat creates anxiety. Uncertainty in the presence of threat creates anxiety. We can't help it. The question is, what do we do with the anxiety? Well, the natural impulse is if you're anxious, reach out to someone, ring somebody up, go and see them, ask them if they're worried. Is it true? But of course, we've got a big constraint here. Uh, luckily, most of us have access to these kind of media. but we, we know there are many people who don't have it. And so what we know is that anything that reduces uncertainty 
will restore a degree of security and reduce anxiety. Now, we can't reduce the fundamental uncertainty, will I get COVID or not? But what we can say is if we hang on to the isolation philosophy, then we will be in the best position not to get it. But then, of course, we've got a whole lot of other uncertainties. So all the uncertainties that come out of being in that uh, isolated situation, we can do something about. And so as time goes by, we've seen how the reduction of the panic buying of uh, things like toilet paper have been gradually uh, reducing and the supply chain is catching up. But we've also now got the beginning of uh, the outreach and the opportunities for older people to go into the supermarket an hour early and say, these are ways in which we're counteracting that debonding. But I suspect there are many ways that uh, we could be doing that, which we haven't actually come to. The real message is debonding is reversed by communicational bonds. They are usually done when people gather together, but we don't have to gather together to communicate. We need networks to be evolving over this period of all sorts, not just the big internet networks, but maybe local networks around particular uh, supermarkets and so on and other shops. We, we also uh, need to be wary of the natural tendency to move out of fusion, sorry, out of debonding into fusion rather than an organised pattern of social interaction. I just want to say a couple of things about that and then talk a little bit about some broader strategies we can be thinking of. The debonding under threat is inevitable unless we've got very good training and we don't lose our role. So debonding always leads to a, an unsustainable situation. I feel isolated, alone, upset, anxious, and so I'm going to reach out and we'll get fusion. What we need to think about is how do we create a frame that guides that fusion into a constructive way so that the reaching out to people gets them something constructive, reinforcing the fundamental factual information making it real rather than going off for conspiracy theories or simplistic alternative views that don't really hold water like uh, what is it drinking uh, a, a last shampoo as a solution these these are the grasping of these simple concrete things f fits that uh, threat psychology um, and i think it's very important that we consider carefully how in a, as a community and as a, a media and uh, all the other communication systems we have that we actually manage these risks. And the, the other important one is to, to realise that there is this innate tendency when you have an unmanageable threat to replace it with a manageable one. Instead of wondering whether I'll get COVID-19, I'll actually worry about toilet paper. So if I go out and buy lots of toilet paper, I'm going to feel a lot better and a lot safer or lots of baked beans or lots of whatever it might be. And this stockpiling has an emotional uh, function uh, and yet it doesn't really address the problem. So eventually um, my prediction would be when the person's got enough toilet paper, their anxiety is still there and it's probably going to latch onto something else. And so I think it's important that we have a, a conversation about anxiety, just like we have a conversation after the disaster about, about loss and about trauma and understanding them and knowing how to look after yourself in them. It means that we have to have a conversation now about anxiety and loneliness and isolation and despondency uh, and help people to move into an active stage where they start to look for means of social organisations, not just ringing up occasionally when I'm feeling upset, but we know what will be more effective is for people to develop a routine and a rhythm. We see our families and our friends on a routine. And the important thing about a routine is that we know it's going to happen then, it's going to happen then, it's going to happen then. So in between, that's just happened and this is going to happen. So in between, there's a continuity. So doing something in a rhythm and a routine that I can learn to trust 
puts it as a structural element in my life. And that's where I think the security comes from. So I think if we can ring Granny up at 9.30 on Tuesday morning, every morning or every week, or maybe every morning for a while, uh, this will become a security element that's actually got a significance beyond what we say. It's not the content, it's the fact of communication that we find over and over again is the important thing. And gradually, people will learn to use it and they'll offload their worries and they'll in ask questions and they'll be open to information. We know after disasters, people are not open to the information now that they're going to need next week. We've got to keep bringing it until they're ready for it and they'll grab it and take it in. The same, I think, will be occurring with COVID. I often uh, feel when I watch the news uh, that there's a very interesting graph or explanation of some aspect of this virus and its behaviour and why it has the effects it has. But it's done very quickly. And as I'm thinking over that, trying to consolidate it, they've moved on to the next item. And by the time I now give my attention to that, I haven't consolidated it. And I'm saying to myself, gee, I hope they say that again tomorrow night because I'd like to hear that all again. I haven't quite got it. Uh, I think we have to understand that in order to, to absorb and to process things, we need to hear them again and again and to speak about them with each other. That's what we take for granted in the normal environment, the repeated exposure of things. And so that means the fusion has to have an alternative fact-based, experience-based communication system, I think that is routinized and repeated again and again. And that when we reach out to draw in vulnerable people into our networks, we think about not just doing it once or twice, but establishing a routine that will go for some months, whatever we can sustain. Maybe if we can only talk to them once a week for 10 minutes, that would be better than having a two hour conversation and then not being able to talk to them for another few weeks. And so uh, to, to sort of draw this to conclusion, um, I think what we can say is the uh, isolation is initially a tremendous pattern of loss. Now the response to loss is grief. Uh, grief for my my walk, my uh, my time with my friends, uh, the coffee I have down the park, and so on. All of these things will create a, a sense of grief. How do we manage that? We know the best thing to do with grief is to give it space, feel sad, and then look for what the alternatives are. That's the important thing. We know that there's a point in grief where the person will say, I finally accepted that that's what had happened. I'd lost my loved one. And once I accepted it, I started to think about the future in a more positive way. Where do I go from here? And maybe there's a community-wide process of acceptance going on. Yes, this really is real. I noticed myself, uh, not this week, but last week in the early part, I'd wake up and then I'd think, oh, I'm working at home today. And uh, that would be novel. And then I'd think, oh, that's right, COVID-19, that's why I'm working at home. Oh, this is huge. This is still going. This is real. Was, you could feel that it's actually penetrating into those uh, taken for granted assumptions. And so that involves this disruption and this loss and this anxiety. And so I think the more we can help in our conversations is to make it real and to acknowledge the disturbing emotions. And then we can actually try to do that all important characteristic of, uh, of resilience and post-traumatic growth, which is how do we accept a reality we can't change and then turn passive into active, into uh, an experience of loss and deprivation, into an experience of opportunity. We've got to let go of what we've lost and we can ask, since I'm at home now for goodness knows how long, what can I do now that I've never had time to do before? What can I do by myself when I don't have access to a lot of things that I've never thought about before? Maybe I should go out and get some ideas about what other people are doing. Uh, 
maybe we all have must have parts of ourselves that we never develop uh, and this will be the challenge is how do we create a life of uh, we've seen these wonderful things that Italians are doing you know singing opera choruses on zoom and uh, orchestras playing on zoom and and uh, and rock musicians on the roofs playing together and so on these these are examples I think this is where our creativity comes in and since the essence of social capital is relationships and relationships are created by communication i think the challenge is how do we establish a culture of communication that's completely different from what we've had before it's not completely different but it will serve different purposes using all the various media brainstorming together and most important looking at who we need to draw into this communicational net that might have dropped out. Uh, and also, how do we feed into that, uh, the continuing fund of information we need people to keep maintaining it. I predict that there'll be a time when people start to want to move on more quickly. Uh, we've had enough of this already. It's all settling down. I'm sure we can go down the beach or go to the pub or whatever. Uh, and so I think this is where it's a real challenge to keep providing this information. So that in essence, I think the important things to keep track of is the debonding phenomena that occur in the loss of our connections and routines and structures. Then the fusion, that means the highly energized coming together in often unproductive, emotionally contagious interactions but also pick out the support and reach out, outreach and uh, assistance measures that are going on and try to see how we can bring some organisation and order that probably will only be temporary, but we don't know what will happen afterwards. And uh, however long this happens, let's say six months, I think in some ways we're still on that very early first couple of weeks and maybe months or six weeks after the bushfires uh, we're still in that early impact and relief uh, period and i can't believe that we won't embark on a recovery process when life goes back to normal we know that when people move into their new house it's only then they begin to grieve a lot of the things they lost in their own house we know that it's only when people have re-established their lives after a uh, a disaster or a trauma, they suddenly go into this period of bone aching exhaustion uh, and the need to really replenish their resources. And I think it'd be very important for us to be thinking ahead to next year. I don't think it's going to be back to business as usual. I think we've also got the economic disaster that's occurring. I think we're going to need a quite different a supportive community-based process going on to help us all rebuild a life and hopefully a life that's a little bit wiser than the one we've had so far on the basis of our experience. I'll maybe leave it there and uh, see if uh, maybe anyone's got any particular questions or thoughts. Sure, Rob. I've got a few questions here um, that I might pose if, if that's good. Please um, add there's a question and answer box and I'll, um, I'll read them out so everyone can see them. So, Rob, I might start with this one. I think it's from uh, Milena. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, so, uh, Milena's from Malakuta. They lost their home on New Year's Eve. Um, they haven't um, returned just uh, yet only to visit. They're currently living in Canberra with her partner who unfortunately has some medical issues um, on top of housing issues, of course, and now the coronavirus pandemic, um, which has sort of taken the spotlight off bushfire recovery. Um, and um, as the broader society sort of fixated, I suppose, on the pandemic um, and appears to have forgotten fire survivors. Um, so how can bushfire affect people still be be able to grieve and share their grief when all seems focused on the pandemic is Melinda's question. I think that's such a, a such an important question and I think there's a very important thing for the bushfires. Um, look I, I've noticed a degree of government commitment to bushfires that's unprecedented in my 40 years experience. I think governments ha have learned and developed 
and uh, I've no doubt that the commitment to this will continue. Uh, I guess one of the things that we can say is that uh, it, it's like a lot of events that occur in ordinary life. Um, people who are bereaved by suicide, who have uh, motor car accidents and other traumas, they will often be surrounded by people that are busy doing other things. And we know that many of these problems are enormously helped by the development of support groups where they can meet with other people in the same situation who get it. Often their, their family members don't get it. Uh, unless you're in that circle of immediate impact. So I think it's going to be the same with bushfires, that it's going to be important for bushfire affected people to create their own networks of recovery. Uh, it is very important to have the broader community acknowledge and uh, respect it. But ultimately, I think the bushfire communities are going to have to work to establish their own means of supporting each other during this time. And, uh, and I think as always, perhaps uh, maybe it'll even help the, the people anxious about COVID to remember. I think the important thing is, to, is stories, stories about what's happening in people's lives. That's what people can fixate on and say, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Yes, that must be really hard. Uh, so any way we can have the media continue to tell their stories uh, will be very valuable. But ultimately, uh, really build those links amongst the bushfire affected community. Uh, thanks, Rob. So we've got a couple of questions here and I might just sort of paraphrase if that's okay. If I don't get it right, just put it back in the, the chat. So there's a number of questions about um, sort of access to communication and technology, particularly for older people or for people that struggle with um, technology um, or access to technology. So you may have touched on a little bit in your answer just before, but how can we ensure that we, we bring those people into um, into being able to connect into information and, and social support and community support? Well, you know, I can only talk about principles. I'm not uh, in a position to sort of make government policy, but, but we know that psychologically it's the communication process that is the medium for support. You could boil it all down and say support is a particular type of communication. Uh, so therefore I'd be saying uh, anyone who becomes aware that somebody is isolated, particularly service providers, uh, district nurses or uh, other people working out in the community, um, anyone who becomes aware even by second or third hand, I think it'd be very important to uh, try and identify what that person's needs are. There will be some people, there are always some people who are happy to be on their own. They, they, they prefer it that way. Life is simpler. But I think it would be uh, really important in the long run to start thinking about how do we provide communicational uh, uh, instruments for people. Um, I understand that, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of assistance to secondary students who don't have access to computers and modems and so on to, to get assistance to get online. Um, and I think ultimately it would be tremendously helpful for that to happen across the community, not just uh, IT, but maybe phones or simple phones or what other means people can use. Uh, and, and this will be a, a real issue for innovation. Maybe there's an enormous role here for community radio and talkback radio to be enhanced. Uh, we, we have to make sure we keep thinking outside the box for people uh, who, who are not able to use the mainstream media. And we all tend to think in terms of our own experience after disasters. Uh, uh, people with non-English speaking backgrounds or, or other ethnic groups to see in what way can they be given assistance within the context of their own culture. These would be uh, part of leading out of this response phase into a recovery environment. Um, so a question here from Catherine, so is around, can we take thinking from other prolonged events like drought, for example, which can have isolating and significant impacts on wellbeing? Absolutely. I was thinking this morning about the 
drought that occurred in the late 80s in Victoria. And uh, it occurred in the context of a tremendous financial uh, problem for the, for the agricultural industry. And one of the concerns that went around that particular area in Victoria was that people had reverted to subsistence farming. And they'd said, well, uh, we can grow our own veggies and uh, we'll just lock the farm gate. Petrol prices were high, that's right. And they felt they just had to completely abandon their social life. That stage, we didn't all have computers, but but uh, but uh, there was a lot of concern because we know if people are isolated, our emotions get out of hand, and that's when depression, suicidal feelings, anger, violence, and so on, build in this pressure cooker environment. All we need to do is take the lid off the pressure cooker, let the steam out, and we do that through communication. So, uh, I think drought-affected communities are very creative and they may have quite a lot to teach us. Uh, and any ideas, I think, that, uh, that drought-affected communities can make suggestions about it would be uh, very welcome. Um, and Rob, this question, I think, is from Andrew, sort of follows on a little bit on the, the drought theme. Um, and I know, particularly in parts of southeastern Australia that have had drought, bushfire, and now um, COVID-19, yeah. Um, and you talked a little bit about an example just there from um, sort of sustained stress on communities, but wondering if you could talk a little bit about how cumulative stress affects the response to kind of successive disasters that people face. Yes. The, this cumulative idea is really important. So the idea of cumulative stress is that uh, you don't recover from one stress before the next one comes. <clears throat> and so your stress level ramps up in increments. Um, and that's different from the one up. Uh, so I think what the danger of that is that people, healthy people that are dealing with the reality of it make a series of adjustments and the adjustments take them further and further outside their comfort zone. Um, I think one thing we can say in general is when people are dealing with this on top of all their other problems, I think it's absolutely essential that they actually make time to develop a survival plan. How am I going to get through this? This is the last thing we needed, economically, socially or whatever, but make a plan. And remember that when you're in that stress, chronic stress state, we lose, we don't have time to go into all the brain process, but we lose access to the parts of our brain which give us creative problem-solving thinking and we revert to the bits behind the eyes which enables us to do our automatic daily survival routines and they are not going to get us through a, a novel and demanding impossible situation we've got to get back to this creative part now luckily what helps us get into that creative part is the right sort of conversation and exchange of ideas and I often think to make those plans, you need to borrow somebody else's brain. Help me think through how we will get through this. And what I think is really important is to go back to the core values that are essential to make your life worthwhile, the core ones. What is the last thing you want to be affected? And start to prioritise around that. And I suspect that means we have to do things we don't want to do. We've got to change priorities, let things go. I wanted to do this. I wanted to rebuild these fences after the fire this year, but Blaze Aid has had to withdraw. I'm not going to be able to do it, or if I do it myself, I may be completely exhausted by the end of it, not to mention having accidents. So what is the alternative? Can I have a different plan and wait and restock later? You know, it's lateral thinking. There will always be ways. When I work with people who are under chronic stress, I always work on the assumption that in that stress state, there are resources, resources you're not using, opportunities you're ignoring, and capacities in yourself that you're not using. And help the person look for it. Uh, the chronic stress gets this narrowing, rigidifying of our whole frame of mind. So this then comes back, who can you reach out to and help you think this through? 
in your family and friendship network or into the professional systems. And I really think a lot of people are going to benefit from using uh, professional support systems that were never thought of using them before. Um, great. So the similar sort of, I suppose, the next part of the question almost uh, from Kirsty. I hope you're, I'm pronouncing your name right, Kirsty. Um, so she's working with communities who are first impacted by drought, bushfire, storm, flood, um, and now... Um, and COVID, but she's finding that some people are kind of in denial about COVID-19. Just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yes, thanks for the issue of denial. That's where I think in that situation, I mean, a drought is an absence of rain, but it has very tangible sensory uh, evidence. You can see it as the land around slowly dies. And all the others have this sensory component. So people are programmed to deal with the physical world. And that's where the idea I, I, I would call COVID an informational trauma as opposed to a sensory trauma. The bushfire and the flood is a sensory trauma. The information is given to us through our senses. But for the informational trauma, the information is given us by other people through ideas. And it all then depends on the trust we have for the other people as to whether we accept what they say. Do we accept what the chief health officer says? Or do we doubt that he's telling the truth or knows what he's talking about? And the politicians and so on. And so this issue of trust is very important. I think one of the things that's very helpful there is to, been shown in other case studies, is to, if you can, recruit in uh, people who have good standing in the community, people who have reputation, have prestige, uh, who have trust and goodwill, and help them to reiterate the, the message, to pass it on, to validate it. Yes, I, 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 it makes sense to me. I'll be doing this. And try to use within communities these uh, we could call them processing networks of actually making sense of this for our circumstances. Probably the denial, the minimising, is motivated by two things. One is, I can't really see it, it doesn't make sense, and there's nobody in this little rural community sick. Uh, but the other thing it's probably dealing with is uh, the, the fact that uh, if I take this on, I start to feel a sense of helplessness. So that's where accepting that we might have to do things differently and talking about what we will put on hold, how will we mothball, I don't know, whatever it is, the economy or uh, uh, our projects or uh, uh, for six months, and what will we use this time for instead and, and being creative about there's an opportunity in here once we can let go of what we can't do. Um, and this is a community conversation um, that, that in whatever ways we can, we have to circulate and people who've got ideas, just tell stories about what other people are doing. Um, thanks, Rob. So just a, a follow-up question from uh, Melina about... Um, uh, she spoke about living in Canberra, being from Malakuta, yes. and, and um, so they are currently in um, Canberra still. And so she's interested in how they can continue to tackle that kind of cumulative grief from their community, but in a in a new community. So obviously they've they're, they're separated from their community geographically. Well, yes, except through electronic means, maybe they uh, should try and check out whether there are people. Uh, whether electronic meetings going on in Malakuta or opportunities to share notes or uh, get the Malakuta mouth, the local newsletter, and find out what's going on. Hopefully they, they get access to that. Um, uh, uh, anything you can actually do to make the link back to your community uh, in social psychology, we call that a reference group. They are the people who I need to compare with. The... Um, uh, the problem of being isolated in Canberra strikes me that I bet they're not the only people who've been uh, bushfire bereaved or, or, or lost their, their uh, all 
in, in bushfire living in Canberra. I wonder if there are people from other fires there. And I wonder if through Red Cross or other support systems, whether there's an opportunity to suggest and then advertise some kind of online support group for people in our environment who have been impacted by the bushfire. Um, it can't be that you're the only one. So I'd say reach out. Uh, here we've got somebody coming up. We've even got someone saying here um, yeah. from Bobbin on the on the mid north coast who's now living in Newcastle. So a lot of people that are yeah. Um, Maybe there could be an online uh, support group for people who are displaced from their environment. There must be thousands of people. people. Yeah, mm, a good idea. Um, so, so maybe uh, it would be. I don't want to drop a Red Cross into it when I mean, it's got enough work to do anyway. But it may need the auspice of a, of an organisation to help get that going. Uh, and it could be maybe Red Cross or maybe. Salvation Army or any of the other agencies that are working in the space uh, to ask them if they can take that up. Um, something we can we can consider. Um, we've still got a couple of, more lots questions. Of, uh, you're lots getting of lots questions. of ideas coming in here, <laughs> Thanks, aren't you? Rob. <laughs> this is why we've got the session. Just you know, get our good ideas. Um, so a couple more questions. So one from Jody. Um, how do we support the community supporters who are at risk of psychological and physical exhaustion and are often acting as boundary riders who keep people connected? Yeah, it's such an important issue. Now, I think uh, <clears throat> we need to understand often they're part of the community and they have effects in their own networks, their families. Uh, that needs to be respected but they usually love the work they're doing and get enormous satisfaction from it. But I think there are a couple of things. First of all, uh, it's really important that everyone and the community included has realistic expectations of them. They, they, uh, that they don't work themselves to, till they drop, that they ration themselves. And what's going to be best for communities is that these boundary riders keep working for the next five years uh, slowly and steadily and they're there over time remember what i said about the routine becoming a structure if it's if it's occurring so it doesn't matter if you have your meeting uh, with your boundary rider i'll call them that uh, once a week or once a month what Im is important is that that person becomes a fixture in your life for the period of time uh, and uh, I'd be urging the, uh, the, the community workers uh, and urging their managers and supervisors to really monitor their enthusiasm because we know the risk is the need is so huge. You will burn yourself out and still not meet it. So better not meet it and keep working for a long time because there'll be all sorts of ripple effects out from your activity. And uh, the other thing I would do is Try to invest in, in, in the organisations that uh, support these people. Try to invest time in opportunities for these workers to process their experience. That's really what helps us to disengage and relax, whether it be debriefing after events or simple reflective uh, conversations, talking about your week. Try to make sure that people don't go to days off without an opportunity to talk with their colleagues about what their last work shift or work period has been like. Because then, as people learn to use this on a regular basis, it's not done on an emergency basis, it's regular, they will actually automatically bring a lot of material in that will help them get things into perspective and get them off their chests. That would be one of the most valuable things, is that regular reviewing uh, and conversation about experience. Um, together with protecting their time off. I suppose further to that, Rob, we had another question from Renee in the, the chat, which is around what sort of messages of support would you suggest for healthcare workers to share with the community, I suppose for themselves, but also for their communities? I, I think, um, I'm not sure how to put that in terms of specific messages, but, but I think uh, one of the things we have to do is if people are going to move to acceptance of this situation, they've got to release some of the emotion that prevents acceptance. And the emotion is generated by, I want it to be this way, but it's that way. 
I expect this and I need this, but I haven't got it. And so we will see this when people talk uh, often with lots of emotion and repeatedly for a long time till all the things that they feel are wrong. And I think it's so important to recognise that particularly healthcare workers have to unload that, that emotion from people and wait until such time as they're ready to take the realistic statement, well, this is how it is. And then I think what's next important is to actually start helping to redirect them on this idea of what can you use this time for? Uh, you will see that if you give those positive messages too soon, it just irritates people. It's like when people come in and talk about resilience in bushfire communities too early. It really just makes people angry. Uh, so think about that unloading. And then I think the positive messages we need to make are there will be opportunities here even if we can't see them now. Uh, what you miss reveals what's important, doesn't it? And therefore, it can be valued. And that value can be expressed. Everybody has the opportunity to express value for each other. Um, <clears throat> creativity, <clears throat> helping, supporting in whatever way you can, whoever you are in the community, looking at opportunities to do that. And maybe we need to give people ideas and have a place where suggestions can be gathered. Um, I, uh, further to your answer to your previous question, Catherine's just asked, um, she says, I hear you on the slow down bit in terms of looking after yourself, but how do we manage our enthusiasm? We know that is a problem and we have to slow down, but but have you any tips on how to actually do it, habit, ritual, pausing, et cetera? She says it's a lifelong challenge for her. I'm sure with yeah. many, other, many, many people as well. Absolutely. Passionate, yeah. uh, passionate workers in many fields. But you see, that touches the fact that the disaster and even this COVID, you can see it is, if you think of it in terms of arousal, arousal being the, energizing of body mind and emotions as a result of something being not only threatening but highly unusual and also creating this very intense opportunity to do something that's highly meaningful now if you look at the media the media is completely aroused all they can do is talk about COVID. they can't talk about well maybe they're starting to get a couple of other items on the end of the news but it's just absolutely saturation so this is a measure of arousal the arousal is this narrowing and fixating on the problem now i think myself having been uh, you know through to many disasters there's a tremendous excitement a tremendous buzz uh, people talk about adrenaline junkies uh, running around from one disaster to the other now i'm sure you're not talking about that but but i think we need to acknowledge it's enormous stimulus to us and if we've wanted to help our community, wow, what an opportunity we've got. So I would say the very simple message is manage your arousal. And that means taking steps, because if you're in that highly enthusiastic state, you won't evaluate things correctly. You'll be frustrated to slow down. And if your manager tells you they want wants you to have a debrief before you go home and say, no, I've got plenty of work to do. I'll make half a dozen visits before I go in there. I'll get all that done and I'll the weekend. And it'll be annoying if they say, no, you need to come back to the office. Uh, so uh, what well, we've got to match, we've got to meet that frustration with a bit of knowledge, just like the COVID knowledge, that you'll last longer and do better work if you manage your arousal. So that means the, the, the basic ideas about arousal. Now, it's physiological de-arousal, you know, breathing steadily, eating well, uh, walking slowly, uh, speaking slowly, thinking carefully, time out, time to have conversations. Just think about the bigger picture and how you uh, can process all those experiences and come out with new learnings. Um, and try to tangle yourself up with other people who can uh, draw you into conversations uh, and, and help you reflect on your own state of arousal. Um, and I think these are really important things to do. Otherwise, uh, you know, we get into trouble, don't we? We're not, not during the time, but we know that health crises will occur sometime after we come out of an extended period of stress where we haven't taken care of ourselves. So 
that's a caution. And the other caution is I notice that people start to make mistakes and they can't prioritise well enough if they get into a too stressed a state of mind, like the recovery worker who was working on her own and was too stressed to read her emails carefully to realise that she could apply for a huge amount of funding by a certain date. She couldn't really take it on. It was too complex. She let it go. She missed the funding. Uh, this is not an efficient way to do it. So we, it's a, a, we need to understand and manage that arousal. Um, a couple of questions, Rob, um, if you've still got energy. You're doing yeah, a great sure. job. Thank you so much. A um, couple of questions about young people and children uh, and also schools. So um, firstly, how do we meaningfully include young people and children in recovery, the recovery and rebuilding process? Children want to be involved. They want, to, they want to help. And I think one of the things we have to do is think about <coughs> what can we give them that suits their age and development and makes them feel part of it and important, but doesn't burden them. And this is, this is the idea of the role. It's very important, I think, that parents take time out and teachers too, I guess, to really think about what's appropriate for the kids, what will enhance and... Uh, expand their their capacity uh, one of the hazards is of course children taking on <coughs> too much responsibility and uh, feeling exhausted by the end of it or not being able to do it and feeling a failure so therefore uh, organizing it takes a bit of energy organize jobs so that they can do it it's sometimes easy for parents to say you know just get out of my way I'll do it myself but it, it'll be of enormous long-term benefit for the child to feel part of it. In the same way with COVID, I think helping the children understand that what's underlying this is that the children have a realistic understanding of the problem. Realistic. <coughs> Whatever way we can explain that to them, the time that's involved with COVID, how they can help, so that they really feel there's something I can do. We convert helplessness into action. Uh, purposeful action. Uh, that's a tremendous benefit. Uh, with teenagers, uh, explain, I would say, particularly teenagers and maybe uh, late primary school kids, explain to them uh, the struggles that we've got as adults and how we're going to get through this. Include them as far as they will understand it. Don't burden them, but in include them. Help them see what you're doing. Open up the uh, conversation so they can ask questions and uh, try things out. Who knows, they might even have some bright ideas that we hadn't thought of. Uh, but most of all, try and identify tasks they can do to help. Um. Well, this is also about young people. So given, and from Michelle, um, given that schools are moving to remote learning, how can teaching staff connect in, inappropriately with students and monitor them for signs of ongoing trauma to ensure that they can respond to needs for greater le levels of health intervention? So I reckon what's important here is to understand that the emotional supportive characteristics of communication uh, not the content, but the style. Uh, so to really listen to how the child or well, the adolescent is communicating, uh, whether they are responsive, whether they are emotionally engaged, whether they actually do their stuff uh, and hand it back, whether they seem to care about it. And our first point, point of contact perhaps should be uh, not, uh, you can do better than that, have another go, but how did you feel when you were doing that? Um, how, how's everyone at home? What's going on at home? Maybe that's a bit of a provocative question, but that's what you want to find out. Um, how is this, when did you try and do it? I, I would, I'd try and get them in a conversation about the work to see what comes out. And uh, I reckon it's a really important thing that, I'll, that we recognize that uh, what will motivate them is wanting to work for you because you care about them. And we can convey that in lots of additional uh, communications between the lines. And then I think uh, to, to uh, maybe the first response is one of 
uh, concern about welfare rather than concern about the the, the characteristics of the, or the, the the level of the work. Um, maybe even to ask them to uh, say when would be a good time for you to do this or something like that. Try to give them a little bit more say in the process and see if that will engage them. Uh, those are a, those are a few thoughts anyway, based on this idea that uh, uh, people will say support comes from the way people communicate. Uh, rather than what they say. Um, some, some further questions more about uh, community kind of processes after uh, disasters. So we've got one here from Elizabeth. How do we help community who are engaged in conflict and angry as part of the process uh, during the recovery phase? I reckon the first thing uh, is to is to analyse what the conflicts are about. Are they cleavages around differences? of impact, differences of assistance? Are they pre-existing interpersonal problems that are reappearing? Um, and uh, I think it's really important to uh, be making clear statements about the best way out of this is for everyone to work together. The community consists of everybody. It's an instinctive reaction to try and exclude people if they're, they're difficult, but we know that that actually just creates a sort of polarisation in that situation. So anything that creates opportunities for people to come together, uh, in this case virtually, to, or through other, some maybe some sequential communication process, emails going backs and forwards or something of that sort, where people can most importantly tell their story and listen to each other. Once we get involved in a conflict, we're probably not so much listening as trying to persuade the other person to score points. Uh, so um, I found it so interesting to see when uh, real communication events are designed and set up uh, that don't get derailed by emotion. In other words, people can be very angry, but we just keep on asking them to tell us about what they're concerned about. And people don't get defensive and reactive but really say, okay, uh, we don't have to sell them all now. We can say, I'll, I'll take that away and I'll come back to you with, and let, let them know and always come back to them, even if you come back to them and say, I've looked at every aspect of this and unfortunately I don't think there's anything we can do. And I'll say, well, thanks very much for trying anyway. Things like that. So think about how to develop communication opportunities. Now, often uh, people in public life have spent a lot of their time uh, having emotional, conflictual encounters with people. And often I notice they're reluctant or a bit anxious about setting these up. That's where I really suggest uh, draw in your uh, psychosocial professionals, mental health or social welfare or whatever, people who are used to managing strong emotions and help them, uh, get them to help you design how you might run this in a safe way. I've certainly seen uh, situations be beautifully resolved by a very well thought out uh, meeting or communication strategy. But I think we uh, grasp the nettle, go for them and, and try and work out how you can bring the issues to the front and, and bring people together on them. Um, so another one, where did it go? Here it is. So um, this is from uh, someone I think in Malakuta, how long does it take to move from the anxiety slash exhaustion from the bushfire adrenal adrenaline to allow for creativity to re-emerge? Re um, we're not seeing the sort of creative creative responses to, for COVID in Malakuta that is in other places. No bear hunt, for example. Um, but is it because we're all too tired? Yes, I would say so. And this is around about the time Four to six months is often a time when the, uh, <clears throat> the adrenaline's fading and people are getting into routine and routine of recovery and feeling, uh, oh, there's a huge amount of work to do here. Uh, and they're starting off by having missed out on their holidays anyway. And so therefore, I, I think to pace yourself. And if you just don't feel or the community just doesn't have the energy to do it, maybe you need to put your energy into resting every uh, possible opportunity you can. I always say that when people feel they can't make decisions because it all seems too hard, 
I say it's not the right time. Just put it on hold. Concentrate on changing your brain, changing your state, and then come back at it. Maybe uh, if that can be signalled, you might be able to get people outside the community to offer a little bit of support and encouragement to to Malakuta or wherever. And for that, we need networking, of course. Mm-hmm. Um. So um, I'm not sure who this is from, but um, we know post disaster that there is an increase in domestic and family violence. And now with with COVID, we have a a sort of worst case scenario. Um, What are some things that we can do um, as a, I assume as a um, recovery um, sector, I think I assume. So this has been uh, uh, an issue that's been, highlighted from past experience, both in relation to bushfires, but also in relation to COVID. In uh, forums that I've been involved in, it's been talked about quite a lot. It's talked about on the media. We need to flag it as a really uh, significant issue. I think, um, you know, there are the formal agencies involved, the domestic violence workers and police and so on. But I think one of the things we can just think about is that there are a couple of things that will promote that. One is the isolation. Uh, the, the, again, the pressure cooker environment of the home. Uh, so I think anything we can do to create engagements and uh, open, open the communication and the exchange of, of information in ways that the family feel comfortable with that is not threatening. And the second thing is I think the, uh, often the violence builds up out of intensified emotion. And uh, that's often anxiety, frustration. Anxiety translates into frustration, but it's about things not being the way I need them to be. And so anything we can do to uh, create multiple opportunities for people just to complain for a start, I think that's enormously helpful. People can let off steam and complain about very frustrating things. Anyone who's dealt with large agencies and been on hold for two hours on the telephone knows what I'm talking about. Uh, so to be able to complain is, is valuable. Uh, just just to have other people saying, how's it going? Anything that uh, then addresses the anxiety and gives reassurance of, uh, you know, when we get very emotional, we lose the sense of time. We lose the sense that actually it will be all right later or this will happen later. We, it's, it's all or nothing now. And so anything we can do to engage with that person and help help them see a longer term outcome uh, and that we will support them during this time will be beneficial. Um, so uh, and then I would also urge people to um, make contact with and make use with uh, multiple uh, education and, and advocacy groups working in this field and make sure they pass those on to wherever they're needed. Uh, thanks, Rob. So a um, couple more things here. Um, uh, I think a follow-on question from Tracy about um, the hurrying slowly sort of thing we've been talking about a little bit um, and being in it for the long term. Uh, do you have any cope, uh, any ideas or sort of tips for coping mechanisms for managing the, the sense of urgency that you can feel? Um, in this work? Um, does that mean in the work or in the situation? Uh, uh, I think, let me do- reread the question. Where did it go? Um, oh. Well, we can talk about can perhaps both him? aspects. Yep. Um, you know, the urgency comes from the sense that there's a threat there. And I think the more we can actually be clear about the threat and get uh, uh, factual information about the way COVID works, the way epidemics work, and hopefully that will be more forthcoming in in the popular media as we get further into it. And it's we get beyond just uh, what the angle the graph is on at the moment. Um, and, and to have this longer term perspective, um, so, so I think there's one aspect of that is about information. And the other is about, um, I would go back and, and uh, reference what I said about arousal, because if it's urgent, 
we're highly aroused. And once we're highly aroused, the question of how urgent it actually is, is has to be has to be decided um, because we may think it's highly urgent because we're highly aroused because we're under threat or very anxious. So I'd always try, try, uh, put the question to you: What would happen if we don't do it now? Um, how long is it really going to take? If it's going to take six months, it's not going to matter so much whether we do something this week or next week. What matters is that we can actually keep going through. So I'd be suggesting to people to be thinking about uh, how are they going. At the moment, it's probably been adaptation. How do I adapt to being at home? Now we, uh, we could be asking ourselves, what am I going to need to get through, let's even just say a few more weeks of this? Uh, and starting to think uh, about what other resources we draw in from that. With the urgency of, of people working in this field, um, I'd say my experience is we can never do things as fast as we need. Actually, most of the time, people aren't ready for them as soon as we, the workers, want to give them. Uh, they, they have to think about it, they have to take time, they have to get ready, they have to understand what's being offered and know how to use it. And so, uh, I think the, the urgency is um, something we should be cautious about. Where we can demonstrate an urgent need, lights and sirens going to someone who's seriously ill, yes, of course, uh, but that's uh, clearly focused on uh, physical problems or identifiable problems. Uh, so maybe we need to come back to having clear criteria about what does require urgent response versus what requires a slowly building response that is redesigning and developing as we go. Um, okay, just a lot. so another one for Maya. Um, so uh, the fear is leading to anger in a number of small communities about people and non-residents. So for example, people without a stable home or those who lost home in the fires or homeless people um, coming into the community. How can we prevent the, dam the damage to the fabric of our communities now and in the longer term? Yes, yeah, so maybe that um, <clears throat> involves uh, sort of concretizing and simplifying the problem. It's strangers that might bring the danger here. Uh, and I think what we would have to do is come back to, uh, are they observing appropriate social distancing and doing all the things that uh, science tells us will reduce the, the uh, impact? Or are they in fact uh, doing things which do make us feel very uncomfortable? then I think it's very important to talk to uh, whomever uh, you can, uh, local government, police, whatever, about helping these people understand that the threat is real and uh, even if there's no uh, COVID-19 in a small rural community, you don't want it there and, and uh, that we take it seriously and, and really uh, making sure there are clearly expressed community norms, community customs about that we are taking this seriously and doing this as carefully as we can. But um, what I'd be doing is I'd be trying to make contact with these people and the, you're going to do much better by drawing them into the community in a controlled way uh, so that they participate in what you're doing rather than uh, uh, this sense of conflict and we don't want strangers here. We know that's a very common uh, conflict uh, or sort of... Uh, uh, emotional reaction after in, in an event of this sort. Um, and I'm just going to sort of, there's a couple of questions here on a similar kind of topic that I'm going to sort of squish together. So apologies if I don't quite get what you've asked, but um, so there's, we've talked a fair bit about, um, you know, moving towards online communications to help people connect during this time, particularly in bushfire affected communities where that kind of social connection is, you know, doubly important now. But um, what about some ways of kind of low fire type things uh, or low fire support? And um, what would be the kind of key things to be looking to do or, or kind of messaging to be sharing, I suppose, is sort of the gist of some of these questions, I think. 
Yes. Or how do we connect people without technology also? Just coming back that what's important is the communication process, mm. not the method or the content, the process, the emotional sense of connection, the amount of uh, the sense of identity and belonging that builds up by talking to people regularly and being accepted. It doesn't really matter whether you're sending smoke signals or uh, on Zoom. Uh, the fact that you know the other person is uh, enjoying communicating with you will, will, will make you feel you belong. Um, and so uh, don't underestimate the power of just phone calls um, and uh, e even any other me methods. And I'd go back to saying we need to be creative. There would be people who would be better at me than this, but... But talkback radio is uh, a very powerful medium if we can get local radio stations to do that. Maybe maybe in time uh, we could even try and uh, develop some kind of informal, uh, I don't know what the details are, of broadcasting or use uh, radio uh, to have periods of time where people can ring in and talk. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm aware of uh, colleagues of mine who run a, a, a support group for uh, serious life-threatening illness and they have people from all over the state where they work ringing in by phone. What's, what's important for this, uh, this phone group that, uh, uh, that I was talking about was they know that uh, on a regular basis, once a month I think it is or whatever, they will ring in and they will meet with each other and they will talk to each other. Uh, now, that's something that is going to extend over uh, years for them. So I think to getting back to the question of the sense of urgency, I think if we can start to set things up now, it'll take a while to get them going. But the real test is going to be probably in a few months' time when people are really heartily sick of this lifestyle. And that's mm. when we want these systems to be uh, in place so that people start to hear about them and use them with each other. Great. Um, now... Um, yeah, somebody just uh, talking about a cancer support group. Uh, yeah, Jennifer says she was a p participant in a cancer council tele telegroup and it was enormously beneficial. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's, the medium is not important. Whatever medium you can manage, I would say, go for it. Um, so a question here from Margaret, to a little, on a little bit of a different um, tack. So do you think that governments will or should put in place community recovery processes or funding to support community recovery processes once the distancing rules begin to ease or even before then, as they do for other emergencies? Um, far be it from me to tell governments what to do, but... Uh, <laughs> um, if they ask me, I will, but, uh, <laughs> but let me put it this way. I can't see that we can avoid a rebound process after an extended period of serious social disruption, not to mention massive economic dis dislocation. Uh, at this stage, I think it's very hard to think beyond that we we're still trying to grapple with the death rate and the illness and the ventilators and the isolation and is everybody isolating and so on and so forth. We're still in, you know, we're still fighting the fire. And so uh, it, it must be, according to that theory about uh, threat creates arousal, arousal causes deep bonding, the bonding is unsustainable and rebounds into fusion and fusion is unsustainable and creates cleavages and tensions. And so I think uh, it, 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 it must be that we're not all just going to suddenly go back to what, what we had before. Uh, so there's going to be a massive task to uh, nurse the economy out of this. It's going to take uh, quite a long time for the economy to get going again. And I think that should be paralleled with the psychosocial recovery process. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it'll look like because it's going to be different, but we know a lot of people with mental health problems and a lot of people with life circumstances that are very difficult without necessarily having a mental health problem are going to experience significant amounts of, let's just call it distress. They don't have to be mentally ill, just very distressed. And when they're very dis distressed, uh, their lives are not going to be working very well in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. and I think that's where we're going to need uh, 
concerted effort to first engage with them and second, come up with some innovative ways in which we can help them uh, work this through. Uh, so I'd say I'll be very surprised if it doesn't take us a few years to get out of this one. Yeah. Um, so a question from Elizabeth. So how do we cope personally with the impact of COVID-19 on getting our homes rebuilt, etc.? Having been measured in my response and planning, I now find that services for setting myself up again have been severely impacted. Yes. So, uh, uh, well, presumably um, you're doing that um, as best you can and uh, there will be, of course, builders who need to earn their living. And so uh, using appropriate social distancing, et cetera, et cetera, to keep, keep the process going. But it surely is going to be disrupted. Probably supplies will be slow. So this is where I think the, the stress, you know, there's, there's a really important equation about stress. It's the external situation plus or multiplied by your interpretation of it equals the stress. So it's that subjective factor. So if you want it to happen the way you had it planned before COVID came along, it's going to probably be very stressful and frustrating. And this is where I think we probably have to reconfigure our expectations. And we probably don't know enough to know how to do that yet. But, uh, but the first step I'd say is we all need to say, well, hang on a second, it's not going to be the way I thought and let it go, accept the situation as it is, which probably involves grief, frustration, uh, and difficulty of living in an unsatisfactory environment longer than you wanted to. So then I'd say, put some of your effort into, how do I make the current living situation better mm -hmm. so that it's easier to manage it for the period of, time, of, of the extra time? What will be important is to try and get some kind of comp uh, estimate of the of the t of the new time frame. Uh, I don't have a, and then maybe well, the other would be build supports around yourself to help you get through this time. You mightn't have felt you needed them, but maybe you will if it's going to be longer than you thought. Um, and just a couple of final questions, Rob. So one. Um is from Sharon who they she says that they're finding it hard for people so they've got a buddy system through phone um, particularly for people who are very physically isolated uh, living in tents and caravans not everyone has taken it up yet about 50 percent so I think her question is around how to get people to connect in um, when they're having tr trouble um, getting people to connect in with uh, support systems um, we, we know that this is the, uh, what is called in the research of disasters, the help seeking problem. Um, that we know that a lot of people, according to our perspective, uh, could do with some help, but they don't seek it. Uh, now, I think we have to create a, a social environment that makes help seeking uh, a respectful, creative, useful thing to do bearing in mind that most people uh, are used to managing their lives with their own resources and those with the help of their friends and relatives and um, using formal systems even formal community systems is very foreign and so what i'd be doing is uh, maybe making sure that the people who are using it talk about what they get from it and how helpful it is Make it practical, not emotional. Uh, and keep it, keep making people aware of the problems. Uh, sorry, of the of the resources, and then identify the problems that people are bringing, uh, so that the person, the people that aren't using, can actually connect with something. Say, so, well, actually, I've got that problem. I wonder if I would get a suggestion. Um, and we know that the, this is about uh, the theory of social capital. Uh, that uh, social capital does give you a sense of belonging which makes you feel bigger and stronger because you're as big as the community. Now that's intangible but it also gives people access to information and resources and networks of, of other people once you become a part of that and so I think just helping people realize those particular characteristics and uh, that people come in gradually. 
after Black Saturday, there were a wave of people, mainly men, came into the system at around the uh, end of the third year and another one around the end of the, th the fourth year. And they were saying things like, I didn't think I needed any help. I thought I could do it myself, but I've hit the world wall and I can't go on. And so I don't think we can push people. We become annoying to them. But I think we can just show them how others are using them and be patient and just keep gently making it available. Um, and uh, perhaps second to last question, perhaps from Marg around how how important is physical contact for mental health and what are the long term ramifications for those who are unable to experience human touch? Oh, so sad, isn't it? Yes. Well, I was talking with a group of psychotherapists last night, and in fact, several of them were talking about their uh, clients who were uh, saying how they realised uh, how profoundly they missed touch, a hug or a pat or a whatever, a kiss on the cheek. Um, uh, I think, you know, these sort of things touch deep cores in our emotional life. And I think one thing that can reduce the impact of that is to talk about it, to make it a subject. Um, in New Zealand, in Christchurch, they had this all right campaign after the earthquake where there were a, a, a sort of a, a whole set of different media, postcards, radio, bus posters, everything, was saying it's, it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to ask if you're okay. You know, to really try and shift the, the sort of stoical idea that you shouldn't talk about your problems. Uh, I think it was a very helpful uh, process going on. And so what we, what we can have here is that people can talk about this and share it. And the moment if I'm feeling uh, a loss of touch and I realise somebody else is feeling a loss of touch, I'm not alone with it. And I can realise this is something we are all dealing with together. And uh, who knows, people will uh, come up with ideas. You, maybe you should uh, have a teddy or cuddle your cat or something or another. Uh, you know, there'll be other ways in which you could deal with it. Mm. Um, and I'm wondering, there's a couple of questions in here that are kind of more general in nature, which we might try and answer in our email, um, which we send out to everyone. Um, I'm just double checking. Oh, I've got a couple of comments in the question box, so I think we're good. Um, apologies if I haven't caught your question, um, but I think we might leave it there. Um, and um, thank, I want to thank everyone so much um, for joining us. And thank you, Rob. Thank you so much for your time and, um, and wisdom as usual. Um, and uh, like I mentioned um, at the beginning, we'll do uh, another couple there's a couple of uh, other Red Cross webinars coming up the week after next, um, which uh, we will put dates for in the email that we send, send you. And also don't forget the, the ADA, uh, ADA webinar tomorrow on community-led recovery. Um, there's been some sharing of, um, of links and things in the chat the chat section here. So we'll collect those and we'll add them all to the email that we send out to you with um, the follow-up survey. And uh, Jamie, what am I missing? Something else? Dates for other things? Um, Thanks, Sherry. So yeah, we will uh, essentially what Shona was alluding to with the survey, essentially we want to know, was this session valuable to you? And what we'll do is invite you to provide suggestions as to how we can improve. And as um, Shona mentioned earlier, this webinar was, re was recorded and will be available through our Red Cross YouTube channel and on our website. So those links will be sent out to all of those attendees and people that registered. Uh, and if you have any additional questions or would like to connect directly with the Australian Red Cross recovery team, you can email us at recovery at redcross.org.au. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, for anyone for tomorrow, um, if we don't get the link to you in time, if you just look on the Australian Institute of Disaster Resilience website, I'm sure you'll be able to find info there. Um, Rob, anything else you'd like to say before we say bye to everyone? Well, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, uh, Great questions. I, I wish, uh, you know, I could give more... Um, time to them and uh, but more uh, more concrete suggestions but I feel we're all uh, trying to apply knowledge from other areas to this completely new problem of COVID 
and uh, I'm sure there'll be much to learn. Uh, the important thing actually is to try and create a pool of exchange where people's anecdotes and observations can be shared uh, and learning so that we, we have a collective mind that's grappling with these. So I'd really urge you to keep in touch with Red Cross as best you can.